Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from Geneva, Switzerland. My name is Bastian Quast from the ITU, and it's a pleasure to interview Frederick Werner, Head of Strategic Engagement from ITU, and one of the creators of AI for Good for the AI Africa Expo to discuss how AI can help advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Frederick, welcome. Hello, Bastian. Good to see you. And I'd also like to thank Nick Bradshaw from AI Africa Expo for the opportunity to be here today. Looking forward. Can you please explain to our viewers in Africa what the ITU is and how AI for Good came to be? Yes, certainly. So the ITU is the United Nations Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies. And we're very unique in the UN system in that our membership model comprises of 193 member states, over 900 technology companies, and 150 universities. And the goal of ITU is basically to connect the world. And how do we do this? Well, in three ways. First of all, we're responsible for the allocation and harmonization of radio spectrum and satellite orbits. We also develop international technical standards that underpin modern telecommunication networks. For example, you and I would not be able to have this call were it not for ITU standards that deal with connectivity, fiber, uh, fiber and broadband, and also video compression technology, one of many examples. And last but not least, we also provide development and capacity building uh, advice to developing countries to help them bring up their ICT infrastructure. And also, the reason why we're here, uh, we're also the organizers of AI for Good. And the goal of AI for Good is basically to identify practical applications of AI to advance the sustainable development goals. And if we go back about five years, AI for Good was built on the premise that we only have a few years to achieve the sustainable development goals that should be completed by 2030. And AI holds great promise to achieve many of those goals. In fact, they, there was a recent mapping in uh, the scientific journal Nature that basically looks at how AI can positively impact the SDGs and negatively impact the SDGs. And what we saw was that over 130 of the targets could be positively impacted by AI. So what we're looking at here is, for example, in the space of healthcare, you have all these AI powered applications, for example, where you could use your mobile phone to detect uh, skin cancer and other skin diseases. You could use a mobile phone, for example, to take a, a picture of your eye to see uh, if you have diabetes or glaucoma or different diseases. Um, there's countless applications to help uh, persons with uh, disabilities, whether it's with mobility or with care or, or to help them see, hear and read. Um, and also it goes well beyond that. So for example, in disaster management, uh, we've seen a lot of promising use cases on how we can use AI to predict uh, natural disasters such as uh, floods, landslides, uh, tsunamis and fires, and also how to better uh, manage our response to these natural disasters. Um, one high potential use case is, is actually analyzing all of the geospatial and satellite imagery of the Earth and basically making that data and imagery available to uh, problem solvers using AI to help predict uh, natural disasters, uh, maybe uh, you know, uh, where identify different uh, conflict zones or, or refugee type crises. So uh, one thing we saw is that the Earth is, I believe, photographed. There's about three terabytes of images generated each day from space of the Earth. And those are photographs of different uh, levels of quality, uh, thermal imaging, all types of images. And uh, the dream of some of the AI participants is if those images were made available, as a kind of uh, public uh, a public resource, if you will, a, a common resource and available to problem solvers, you could uh, solve uh, countless numbers of problems combining imagery uh, with data and uh, AI powered algorithms to, to solve uh, any number of, of issues. So the, the use cases are there. Uh, we've seen other use cases, of course, in uh, education, for example, uh, AI powered uh, applications to help with uh, literacy or to help with uh, language learning or even discovering lost languages, remote learning, for example. And of course, issues like uh, gender equity, either spotting inequality and helping to fix those inequalities, um, many, many positive use cases. Of course, this isn't without their risks, right? So if you look on the flip side, uh, the study found that 60 of the SDGs could be negatively impacted by AI. So of course, top of everyone's mind is job loss. Will we lose our, our, 
our, our jobs due to automation. And uh, the latest studies indicate that indeed millions of jobs could be lost, but also millions of new jobs could be created. So the, the issue is how do we manage that transition in, in a way that that isn't too damaging. Um, another big issue is the issue of bias. So AI is being used more and more in decision making. Uh, so for example, uh, will you get hired? Will you get a loan? Will you be released from prison? Uh, there's countless applications where AI is used in a decision making process. But we, we have to be sure that those decisions are made on data sets that are free of bias or as a free of bias as possible. And also that the decision making process is somewhat explainable and that there's always a, a human in the loop. Uh, another big issue is ethics. Um, I mean, the classic problem with uh, the autonomous car going down the road and should it, you know, swerve to avoid hitting a child and, and kill the passengers or should it kill the child? I mean, that's a very simplistic uh, example, but it shows uh, the you know moral dilemma behind a lot of choices that will be need to that will be need to be made as we start to deploy AI in, in robotics, in autonomous cars, in different applications and softwares that, that have decision making, and this is something that's uh, you know occupies a lot of brain power of our of the participants of the summit. Um, likewise, if you look at issues of privacy. Um, what will that mean, actually? And, you know, the saying that data is the fuel that fuels AI. And, of course, data contains all types of uh, issues uh, where, where it's your maybe your personal data, your, your location. Uh, a lot of these applications use facial recognition now where they can identify you through security cams and your phone. And so how do you actually manage that in a way where you can share data and make the AI, AI algorithms as useful as possible? but also respect for privacy and make sure that the personal data is not actually shared and handled in any way. And that there are techniques for doing that. And that's something that the, our participants are working on. Um, likewise, uh, security and safety. Uh, there's a saying uh, that goes, uh, if anything that will be hacked or anything that can be hacked will be hacked. And we've already seen this in the past 10, 20 years, that cybersecurity is a huge concern. Uh, but when you start to have, um, you know, autonomous cars on our roads and all types of uh, robotics and applications that are involved in your daily lives, the cybersecurity and the, the safety of these applications becomes ever more important. Um, a big issue as well is also will AI help to bridge the digital divide or will it make the digital divide worse? Um, I think developing countries probably have the most to gain from AI, but possibly the most to lose as well if we don't handle that in, in a proper manner. So that's also very much top of mind. And last but not least, will we become irrelevant? There's always the, the hope or the fear that uh, general AI uh, might be around the, the corner. Uh, some estimates say as early as 2040, some say it will still take centuries, some say it will never happen. Um, that's more of an existential question, but that's also very much uh, top of mind. Uh, so not, not to dwell on the negative, but when you look at the use cases and the mapping and all of the sessions that we've had in AI for Good over the last five years, it's overwhelmingly clear that there's more positive use cases than negative use cases. And the, the whole point of the summit is to bring people together who don't normally come together to help chart a, a positive and beneficial uh, course for AI that's aligned with our, our values and our goals. And speaking of goals, you know, what, 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 what are our goals and, and what is considered to be good? Uh, the different countries and groups of people and cultures have, have maybe have a different uh, expectation or definition of what is good. Uh, but instead of uh, reinventing the wheel, we rely on the sustainable development goals uh, agreed upon by 190 plus countries as a guiding framework for AI for good. And I think that's been very useful, whether you're a startup, uh, wherever you're Google, whether you're an academic uh, doing research, uh, the sustainable goals, uh, development goals has been a kind of a lighthouse or a beacon um, helping us to, to make sure that we actually do chart a positive path for, for AI. So simply put, the goal of the summit is to connect AI innovators with problem owners and to create practical applications of AI to advance the sustainable development goals and to make sure that we scale the solutions for global impact. That's a very ambitious goal. How exactly do you achieve that? Well, thank you. And uh, first of all, we, we can't do that alone. 
So that, that's why the AI for Good has 38 UN sister agencies as partners. And it's very important to bring as many voices to the table as possible. So the AI experts themselves would say that AI is too important to leave to the experts alone. So if you look at all our programming and you know our basically our goal of being the, the, the most diverse, neutral, and global AI for good platform that exists, uh, we bring together uh, UN agencies, uh, member states, uh, government agencies, NGOs, uh, top industry players, uh, startups, uh, academics and researchers, and even going to bring in uh, artists and athletes and the creatives. And of course, you know, we aim to be multi-generational, multidisciplinary, multi-stakeholder, uh, multi-everything, if you will. Uh, but we do believe that having as many people to the table is uh, very important if we're going to have a, an inclusive uh, say in, in how AI develops and how AI is aligned with our, our values and our goals. And maybe adding to that, um, I, I think your question was also, how do you do that? So one of our uh, claims to, to fame, if you will, is that we're, we're action oriented. And, um, you know, there, there's a lot of different events and platforms where, where you know, you, you can talk about AI, you can talk about a, AI for good. Um, but we like to think that we're action oriented. And if you look at some of the outputs of the summit, uh, there have been quite a few. And uh, so I'd just like to highlight uh, of that AI for Good generated uh, five uh, pre-standardization efforts on a, on a number of topics. So the first was the AI for Health focus group developed with the World Health Organization. And the goal of that focus group was basically to develop a benchmarking framework for the testing and evaluation and efficacy of AI for health algorithms. And what I mean by this is, you know, you have no shortage of AI for apps going up on the app store, being developed by private companies, and all of them hold great promise. But how do you know that these applications are good? And how do you know that they will work equally well on yourself or on persons of color or people of different ages, uh, of different genders? And these are things that don't naturally occur to people as they develop products. And if you were, for example, a, municipal, a municipality or, or a policymaker or, or a hospital or someone who has to start to think about, you know, strategy and policy and how do we actually use all these applications, which, which hold great promise, um, this benchmarking framework will be very useful in helping you to decide what is acceptable, what is good and compare to, to other applications. Um, we also developed a focus group on uh, AI and autonomous and assisted driving. And basically what they're trying to do is create what would be the equivalent of a, a driving test or a driving license for autonomous driving. And so the whole goal of this group is how can we ensure that AI on our roads is safe according to standards and that they can uh, coexist with you know, pedestrians and cyclists and, and other cars. So they're doing really important work there. Uh, likewise, we launched a group called uh, AI and Environmental Efficiency. And what's interesting there is you can see AI as a high potential tool to increase energy efficiency. So there's lots of great use cases on how AI can help with uh, making energy consumption more and more uh, efficient, uh, you know, better battery life, uh, all these things helping with uh, climate change and what have you. But at the same time, we've seen that AI technologies are very uh, energy intensive themselves. So they're exploring uh, both sides of, of the coin there. And we also recently launched a new uh, focus group called uh, AI and Natural Disaster Management. And basically they're working on creating best practices on how to uh, predict natural disasters, whether they be tsunamis or floods or, or wildfires and, and of the likes, and also how you can better uh, manage them and mitigate them. And uh, this group has, uh, it was launched last year with, with huge momentum and they're, they're doing some really important work there. Uh, last but not least, I'd like to mention a, a focus group uh, that, that has already come to term, which was the Machine Learning and 5G Network. And they've already created standards and they created a, a toolkit for the deployment of machine learning in 5G networks. Uh, this is also supported by a machine learning and 5G challenge where they've had thousands of competitors competing to solve machine learning puzzles in uh, 5G networks. For example, how can you try and predict 
the effect of uh, adverse weather conditions on 5G network transmission, for example, or how can you make uh, networks more energy efficient or more secure or safe or optimized? Uh, very interesting work there. Um, so I'd like to think of as these focus groups of these pre-standardization efforts as the preconditions for scaling AI for good. Because whether you're looking at, you know, working on the healthcare uh, type solutions, uh, environmental efficiency, autonomous driving, natural disaster management, 5G networks, uh, one thing they, they have in common is when, when you go through this pre-standardization process, you know, you're, you're looking at things like uh, definitions and taxonomy and frameworks and models, and also uh, they're playing around with different uh, sandboxes type environments to test uh, algorithms with different data sets, coming up with best practices, uh, they're doing benchmarking. And I like to think of all of these activities as the preconditions for scaling AI for good problem solving, because these are all practical things that need to be solved if AI is going to be trustworthy, if it's going to be scalable, if it can be actually market implementable in, in different products across different countries, and also that they can work internationally and, and that they can in interface with each other. So some very important work uh, taking place there. Uh, another thing I'd like to highlight as a practical outcome of the summit is something we call the innovation factory. So that's basically an online pitching competition where we do a call for startups. Uh, startups that are specifically using AI in innovative ways to advance the sustainable development goals. And um, what's great about this process is that it really identifies practical solutions that are, exist today that are in products. And uh, you know these startups, they compete, they pitch, they pitch to an audience of mentors. And these mentors, uh, they might be venture capitalists, they might be innovators, they might be CEOs, and anyone who sort of has, has a good understanding and handle on business, uh, giving them advice. Uh, but at the end of the day, the, the goal of the summit is to identify practical solutions of AI, and this innovation factory has, has been very uh, interesting in, in generating these solutions. And something a bit, um, a bit left to to that is uh, we also have what we call the artistic intelligence program and what we found through the summit is uh, there are a number of artists that are using AI in innovative ways to influence their artwork and also to push the limits of, of human creativity and performance. So whether you're a musician or a poet or an artist or a photographer, uh, we've seen some amazing use cases of uh, artists using AI and especially with a positive message of sustainability. So um, we also have the artistic intelligence program where basically artists uh, submit their artworks and they're evaluated and showcased uh, on AI for good and basically building a community around these, these uh, amazing artists. So as you know, we are at AI Africa Expo and there's a lot of discussion about how developing countries can benefit from AI. Could you maybe speak to that? Yeah, definitely. So that, that's been a topic of debate since the launch of, of the summit. And if you think about data as the fuel that feeds AI, and if you think about developing countries and how they might benefit from AI, before you can have data, you need to have connectivity and digitization because it's that connectivity and digitization that will create the data that will allow you to eventually benefit from AI solutions and you know basically realize the, the promise of AI. And what we've seen at the summit is there's no shortage of useful AI for good applications, whether they be in, in healthcare or, or in agriculture or in transport or mobility, smart cities, um, loads of great uh, applications. But I think it's one thing to develop an application in Silicon Valley or in Shenzhen, where you know you have uh, lots of capital, you have lots of technology, you have lots of brain power, uh, sometimes done in a very controlled type environment. And it's a very different thing to try and deploy those solutions across 50 plus African countries and all the challenges that that might entail, wherever it may be physical challenges on the ground, financial challenges, uh, political ch challenges, societal challenges. Um, so what we've seen with AI for Good is that the understanding of, of context is extremely important. So when, when we say we want to connect AI innovators with problem owners, the AI innovators could be anyone. It could be uh, Google, it could be an academic uh, 
Oxford, it could be uh, Huawei or ZTE or any technology company. Problem owners, um, again, quite a broad definition, but anyone who's looking to use AI to, to solve their problems, um, that could be a UN agency, an NGO, the mayor of a city, a hospital, a clinic on the ground. And helping them to speak the same language is very important. And we've seen that if you can create a kind of common language, a common understanding uh, between these players, and maybe even create a kind of framework or, or a connection mechanism where you can connect an AI innovator with a problem owner, then we could start to you know, realize the, let's say, the promise of, of AI for good. And we've seen how COVID has changed the world as we know it. How does this affect AI for good? So like everyone, we had to reinvent ourselves uh, in March of uh, 2020. Uh, but instead of waiting for some kind of green flag or, or green light when things would return back to normal, we basically decided to, to start taking our sessions and putting them online weekly and uh, seeing what kind of uh, response we would get. And as we've gone through the months and, and now years, we've seen that this has had actually a number of benefits, at least as regards to AI for Good and our audience. So by going virtual and you know having weekly programming two, three times a week, different time zones, we've been able to reach massively more people. So the Geneva Summit uh, used to gather about two, 3,000 people each year in Geneva. And since we've gone virtual, we've reached over 100,000 people online. Uh, we've increased our subscriber base to 30,000 people. So these are people actively uh, receiving our invitations and joining our sessions. Uh, we've been able to increase the, the gender balance from 37 to 47%. Um, we more than doubled the number of uh, developing countries participating because obviously flying to Geneva was always an issue, but now people can connect from anywhere. And this has really led us to be, become the most you know, global, diverse, and inclusive platform on AI uh, globally. And um, also more than that, uh, we were basically we, we say now that AI for Good, it's more than a summit. It's, it's basically a year long online community where people get together to learn, they get together to build and collaborate, and they get together to network. And, you know, as I highlighted in my previous answers, um, yes, there's the programming track from the AI for Good uh, Summit that everyone was used to. But on top of that, we have a number of focus groups. Uh, we have uh, different AI and data challenges. We have the Innovation Factory. We have the Artistic Intelligence. Um, we're all launching a, a new online uh, networking community in a, in a few weeks. And um, basically, we've been leveraging the online opportunity as much as possible so that if and when we do return to physical events, then we, we can leverage all of that to our advantage. Okay, thank you. Any final message that you might have for the audience? Yeah, definitely. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Nick Bradshaw and uh, John Kamara um, for their support. And uh, so AI Africa Expo has been a close partner of uh, the AI for Good since uh, 2019. And in fact, we've done quite a few sessions together. So quite often when we do African related content, it is done in partnership with uh, AI Africa Expo. Uh, we did a a very good session on uh, the digital divide with the South African uh, ICT minister last year, and that was the best attended uh, session of last year. Uh, we recently did an innovation factory focused on South Africa, which uh, generated some really interesting solutions from, from Egypt and Ghana and uh, Nigeria uh, on topics from uh, financial inclusion to uh, agriculture to, to healthcare. And I uh, just really like to think, thank them for you know, bringing the African community to AI for Good and for letting us bring AI for Good to the African community. Uh, last but not least, uh, I would encourage anyone to go to aiforgood.itu.int to check out our, our weekly programming. Uh, it's open, it's free for anyone to sign up and to receive our invites. And also, if you are interested in getting your hands a, a bit dirty and uh, getting you know into uh, AI for Good collaboration type efforts, uh, more uh, specifically the AI for Good uh, focus groups, 
Um, again, these uh, groups, they, they meet uh, many times a year. They're all meeting virtually. There's no membership required. It's open to anyone who has an interest in the topic and who thinks that they can contribute. So I would recommend that if you want to get involved with uh, pre-standardization efforts, uh, you can also go to the website and sign up for our focus groups. And last but not least, if you're a, a new business or a startup using AI in a unique way to advance any of the SDGs, I would recommend that you also sign up and compete for the Innovation Factory. And you know, this is a year-long live pitching competition. Uh, they, they have monthly sessions, and I think you'd probably have a good chance of competing. And with that, Bastian, I'd like to thank you for your time and uh, wish uh, AI Africa Expo all, all success with, with, with our event over the next few days. Thank you, Frederick Werner from the ITU. Goodbye. Thank you.